Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next up, uh, for our last talk, actually, at the AI Village, uh, we have Shimon and Tal on noisy distribu uh, distorted data sets. Um, and let's all give them a round of applause. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here on this uh, Sunday talk. Uh, actually, it's quite a nice attendance for a Sunday morning. Uh, we're, as presented before, Shimon and Tal, and we'll be talking about how we take noisy and distorted, or initially noisy and distorted data sets and data sources, and bring them into being excellent prediction models. Just a bit about ourselves. So, uh, as said before, I'm Shimon. I'm the VP of Research and Deep Learning at Deep Instinct. I've been working with Deep Instinct for the past three years, since mid-2016, but overall I have roughly 16 years of experience in cyberspace, uh, both in offensive and defensive positions, both deep into research, but also in recent years more in management positions. Uh, so good mor morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tal. Uh, maybe some of you remember me from the talk uh, about uh, malicious uh, Chrome extensions uh, two years ago, uh, two days, days ago. ago. <laughs> um, so it's a good, pl big pleasure uh, to be here again. Uh, I'm working uh, Deep Instinct as well for the past two years and a half. Uh, PR to Deep Instinct. I've been serving uh, at the IDF for seven years. Okay. <clears throat> so after you know us a bit better. Let's talk a bit about uh, this talk's agenda. Uh, we'll start by introducing the problem that we're about to talk about in the next 40 minutes or so. I guess a lot of the people sitting here know that putting together excellent data sets is hard. Uh, uh, it's not an easy task, uh, and it involves a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of trial and error. We'll be talking about some <coughs> main problems, sorry. <coughs> main problems and common issues when it comes to building those data sets. We'll be talking about source quality, accuracy, and diversity, and how do we evaluate those. We'll be talking about issues related to specific file formats and how file formats in general uh, might affect the way that we build and engineer data sets. And then we'll talk about some noise and distributions uh, and distortions error, uh, issues in threat intelligence sources. We'll conclude and wrap up by uh, talking about how everything that we will be talking about uh, drills down to the way that we conduct research into false positives and false negatives of um, the different models that we create. And we'll, ta we'll talk about some tips and recommendations about how to build the best data sets possible. Let's get started. Uh, all right, so uh, the problem that uh, we are trying to, we are talking about uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, so basically, uh, the very first step at uh, every uh, creation of a model is building a data set. Um, the data that uh, is uh, is used for the data for the data sets is of course uh, is an important uh, uh, important step in the, the creation of the model. Uh, as uh, was stated uh, two years ago in a presentation uh, by uh, Hillary Sanders, uh, they was talking about uh, how bad data affects the the results of uh, of the model that you create. Uh, so in this talk, we would like to dive into uh, some specific use cases uh, and the issues that uh, we have experienced uh, in our work, in the everyday work, um, uh, and how, uh, how these issues uh, affect uh, the data set that uh, you might build. Um, so we will be talking about uh, um, some sources. Um, uh, the commercial feeds, such as the uh, virus toler and uh, reversing labs, um, uh, malware uh, repositories, like free uh, repositories, uh, and uh, software repositories, such as uh, uh, NSRL. Okay, so we, I briefly mentioned before some of the, uh, uh, the, the main three topics. What we'll be showcasing in each one is, is as as follows. When it comes to source quality and accuracy, we'll talk about free and open malware repositories. They're a good thing, but we also need to be careful, careful about using them. We'll show why and 
how. Uh, we'll talk about sample duplications and the way that those duplication manifest in uh, the most common thread intel feeds. As far as file format issues, we'll showcase how the threat landscape in two specific file formats, XLS, Office Files, uh, or Excel office, office Excel, you know what it is, and, uh, and RTF, how the threat landscape in those two file types manifests into a very, um, very specific distribution of the files we see in the threat landscape and, and how that might affect the data sets and ultimately the models we build. And then moving on to noise and distortion, threat intelligence will show um, even sometimes how time distribution can be very weird and that, it, and that in itself is not a, 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 desirable, uh, a desirable situation that might have pretty adverse outcomes. And we'll talk about two uh, specific threat landscapes, one being the 64-bit PE threat landscape and the second one being the, uh, yes, even Android gone into this talk, uh, how these two threat landscapes have very, very dense and specific distributions that also, that, that ultimately we might also, we might even call them a distortion of, uh, uh, of a kind and how that might affect how we, um, how we should build the data sets around those kind of threat landscapes. Let's get going. All right, so uh, uh, the first category is, uh, is, the, is the sources. Uh, so uh, there are uh, like two different kinds of sources. Uh, the first one is the free uh, repositories, uh, and the second one is the commercial. Uh, we'll use uh, two use cases, different use cases, one from uh, free repositories, and the, the second one is from a commercial one. Um, so, in general, uh, I'll start with the, the free repository. Um, every repository is welcome. I mean, when you, if you can get like more data, so actually it's good. So every time when there is like a, a new repository out there, uh, we are happy. Uh, we would like to to take this data and to use it and to like. Uh, uh, put it uh, into our uh, databases and uh, to connect it to our uh, data pi pipelines. Um, so it should be a good thing in general. Uh, but uh, sometimes when, you, when we start looking at the data, uh, it's not as good uh, as we might expect it uh, to be. Uh, since a lot of uh, repositories are biased and uh, are indeed noisy, uh, which uh, create uh, imbalances in your data sets if you take it as is. All right. So the first use case uh, that we will be talking about is the free uh, open uh, uh, repositories. Uh, there are a lot of uh, repositories out there. Uh, some examples are shown in the presentation. Uh, we took one uh, repository uh, that we've facing. We've been facing like uh, a lot of times. Uh, uh, we found it very used uh, by customers and by uh, researchers. And uh, we'd like to see what uh, what lays inside uh, these repositories, uh, this specific uh, repository, uh, since uh, it was really used a lot and uh, we saw that uh, in general the results that we had on this repository was not as good as uh, we are used to have. Um, so we took a data set of 130,000 uh, samples from uh, this repository. Uh, and this repository uh, claims to be uh, containing malware only. Uh, so we try to uh, answer uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, what is the relevance of this repository? Like, what uh, can you do with this, with this repository? And the second, how uh, good the data that lays inside is, or, um, uh, or actually, uh, is it really containing uh, only uh, malicious files as it claims? Uh, we have also uh, published a blog post about it, so you can read about it later. Um, so, uh, about the data that lays inside this uh, repository. So, as you can see, uh, only around 60% uh, uh, were P files, and uh, there was uh, like a very huge amount of files that were just textual files, uh, which of course cannot harm a computer, and uh, it's a bit problematic to like classify them as uh, malicious files. Um, and uh, of course, that the data from uh, this uh, this repository cannot be, cannot be taken as is for uh, testing uh, models, for example. 
uh, but uh, we saw that the, the distribution types, uh, and uh, of course that not everything is be in this repository, but uh, at least uh, we hope to see that everything uh, is indeed malicious files as it claims to contain. Uh, so uh, we took uh, the data set and, that we created before, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, we tried to figure out how many uh, malicious files are indeed lays, uh, lay in this uh, repository. Uh, we, found out, we found out that there are only 56% uh, uh, malware files uh, in the PE uh, section of the data set. Uh, we were truly amazed to see that uh, about 40% are poor and around four, uh, or five, or f uh, three or four percents were just benign files. And we say benign, we mean uh, pure benign files, like not something that can be uh, poor or stuff like that. Uh, so of course, that as you can see, uh, data from uh, this repository cannot uh, be taken as is for uh, testing models or, uh, or, or training sets. Uh, of course, that uh, one can use uh, the data from this repository. Uh, it's open, it's free. Uh, you, you should be trying to use it. Uh, not everybody has like uh, you know API keys and uh, to commercial feeds, uh, but uh, you cannot take it as is, and you need to do some uh, engineering on the data before you take it. So that's the the bottom line. Um, all right. Uh, another uh, use case that uh, we might uh, we will talk about it is um, is from commercial feeds. Um, this uh, use case is the sample duplication. Uh, a lot of times uh, there is a, like a specific sample that uh, is changed uh, with a few bytes inside the file and is uploaded again. And uh, of course, that the change uh, the change uh, makes the file has a, a new hash, and uh, and then you find the like thousands or even tens of thousands of times, uh, similar files, almost the same file with a few uh, bytes that are changed uh, inside the commercial uh, repository. Uh, so let's talk about a few examples for uh, this case. So the first is like polymorphic uh, malware. Uh, in order to uh, like evade IOC based uh, detection uh, that is used by a lot of vendors, um, Sometimes malware uh, changes like something inside the file, like uh, 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 first to, to, to change its hash, uh, and second to change uh, some IOCs such as file name or IP address or uh, or things that uh, vendor can uh, can sign on. Uh, the second use case is uh, virus uh, infected files. So. Uh, Viruses, in general, uh, what they do is like uh, infecting uh, a file. We will see uh, in the next uh, uh, next in the presentation. We'll talk about a, a use case that uh, a virus like change something in a file in a Microsoft file and uh, how uh, it affects the the data. Uh, and the last but not least uh, use case is the mass submissions. Uh, so a lot of times there are like researchers or even threat uh, actors that try to see if uh, their new brand new malware is caught by uh, vendors. So they can like change a few bytes or change something in the behavior of, of their malware and upload it again to, to VirusTotal, for example, and, and then we, end up, we can end up with a lot of uh, duplicated samples, again, with different hash, but very, very similar uh, files. Now, let, let's back up for, for one second. Uh, mass submissions, are we actually talking about a poisoning attack? Uh, we're here in the AI village, and I think that poisoning attacks or attacking AI in general is one of the most discussed topics. So one could say, uh, and, and this, for the people sitting in this room, this might be quite appealing or attractive even to say it, that, wow, we're actually seeing AI poisoning attacks. Uh, so we actually think that the, this, this mass submissions use case is not exactly that. First of all, because as we said, in, in many cases, uh, we see that these mass submissions 
are coming from users with API keys, and those tend to be usually consumer, usually consumers on the defense side of these, uh, um, of, of these uh, feeds and sources. Uh, not to say that when it comes from threat actors, this is not uh, maybe also used not only for testing their own malware, but also to try maybe and confuse or, or, or send, you know, send researchers and send the security industry into different places. They want to want, the, 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 the attackers maybe don't want them to look at, so they'll upload mass amounts of files and to cause you know, someone to think that you know, this is the hot stuff right now, but actually they're doing something else. So, but still, there's a difference between uh, a, you know, a, say, poisoning attack and uh, just you know, doing something massive in order to, cons to, to, to confuse your, your enemy or your adversary. So we think it's more the second case than the first. So we're not still seeing actually targeted poisoning attacks. Not to say that it, not, that it might not happen uh, uh, in the very, very near future, but we don't think that's exactly uh, the case as it. But still, taking those mass duplications in, might inadvertently actually cause those mass submissions to be uh, a kind of poisoning attack. So that's why we chose to bring it forward here. All right, so uh, uh, let's talk about a specific uh, example of uh, a, a malware, a polymorphic one, uh, that uh, has been uploaded like uh, tens of thousands of uh, 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 times with uh, different hashes. So uh, we're talking about the Ramnit. Uh, Ramnit is a worm that is active for uh, more or less uh, seven or eight years already. Uh, and as you can see in these results, uh, it's uh, it has been uploaded a lot of times. Uh, we used uh, its SSDIP uh, and the uh, uh, after uh, taking this uh, this SSDIP, uh, we looked at some of the samples that lays that lay inside uh, this cluster uh, in order to figure out if they are actually the same uh, file or not. So, uh, as you can see, we found out that uh, all these files were uh, in the size of uh, 3.5k uh, kilobytes, uh, and uh, they were all uh, DLL files. Um, the sections was uh, was the same uh, sections uh, by hash, uh, at least three out of four. Uh, about the the fourth one, uh, it was the data section, uh, and the section uh, hash was different. So uh, we were interested uh, in like taking this example uh, to showcase uh, why uh, the sample duplication uh, actually happened. Uh, so we looked uh, further uh, into this uh, data section in order to see what is the difference about. Uh, so as you can see, the difference were, were, was in only a few bytes, the red bytes uh, in, the, in these uh, screenshots, um, inside the, the data section. Um, uh, these few bytes uh, were uh, looking very interesting uh, because it's, uh, it's actually a string. So we decided to, to took uh, uh, these uh, samples and to figure out like what, this, what these strings uh, actually used for. Uh, so by looking uh, uh, with IDA on these samples, we were able to find out that this cluster of SSDIP uh, contains like a lot of uh, samples that are used to be the loader of the actual malicious uh, file, uh, actual malware Ramnit. Um, so as you can see, the string was uh, some string dot exe, uh, and this is the loader, and the, the actual file is being um, loaded after that uh, by using the create process uh, API call. Okay, uh, let's move on to talk a bit about issues that are very related to the format uh, of the files themselves. So um, b before we get into it, let's, let's think for a second what actually makes a file format a format. Um, and and what do different, how do different formats uh, ve are different from one another? So formats define you know, the file's structure, its header. The, the syntax, meaning the, the actual binary sequence that separates between different parts of the file. Uh, 
um, the type of data that we can find in the file, whether it's a textual format or some kind of binary format, what kind of other data might be found uh, within the file, whether it's compressed data, photos, pictures, uh, compressed data, encrypted data, etc. And of course, different file formats uh, have different functionalities, okay? Um, for instance, you know, a PDF has its own functionality. Uh, Office files have their own functionalities. Uh, uh, PEs have their own functionality. They're meant to allow code to run. Um, the way that this uh, relates to what we're talking about here is that the threat landscape of each file format is based on that functionality and on the context in which it's being used. And in many cases, Actually, usually in most cases, attackers abuse the innate attributes and functionalities that lay in the different formats that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and use those in order to achieve their, uh, uh, their malicious intent. And when we say that, we mean that in many cases, uh, a lot of the file formats can be uh, abused without actually you know, leveraging vulnerabilities or exploits. And let me give a few, example in, in, uh, a few examples in that regard. When uh, someone embeds a malicious JavaScript, uh, regardless of what the JavaScript does, into a PDF file, uh, so you know, having JavaScript in a PDF file is not a vulnerability, it's a feature, okay? Uh, even if that JavaScript you know, triggers some kind, of, some kind of exploit, the fact that, again, JavaScript is supported in PDFs. The same goes for macros in Office files, right? I mean, having a macro is not, again, is not a vulnerability, it's a feature. Uh, so, and, and if you look at every, uh, every file type that can be abused, and of course, even looking at PEs, you know, if the PE is running, okay, it might not, it might have, not, might have you know, sh shouldn't have been there in the first place, but the fact that it's running, you know, that's what it does, it's running, it's running code on the machine. So again, all those things, when you come, when you think about it, um, uh, in, in many cases, there isn't really any vulnerability or exploit necessary, it's just abusing what the file format allows us to do. Uh, the fact that this is how the majority, actually, of the threat landscape behaves makes us think uh, that we need to be very, very careful in examining how malicious files look like and how the benign files look like because we don't want these... Uh, again, seemingly malicious, but not necessarily malicious, um, you know, differences between, you know, m the way malicious files look like and benign files look like to affect, uh, to affect our models. Uh, and let's give uh, a few examples here to, uh, to, and demonstrate what we're talking about. The next few slides will all relate to just uh, random uh, recent data sets uh, of 100K, uh, known benign files from each file type that we'll show, and uh, 100K malicious files from each file type that we'll show. We'll, we use a very, very uh, naive um, ground truth uh, uh, approach here with, uh, as far as the malicious label is concerned, with just anything with more than 20 engines, uh, det 20 detections in either virus total or other threat feeds that we have. So let's talk about uh, Excel files. You know, uh, we don't need any kind of AI machine learning or deep learning or what have you in order to, uh, um, to have a pretty good uh, detection mechanism for malicious ex uh, Excel files. We, just can, we, ju we can use just one if, st if condition uh, and get 95% you know, recall and only, again, with one if statement, it's not bad, uh, only 10% and false positive, if we just say, you know, if this is an Excel file and it has macro, let's deem it malicious. Because if you look at, you know, uh, at macro content, uh, so only, yeah, only about 10% of the benign files, uh, of benign Excel files have macros in them, where, uh, you know, like on the other hand, a whopping 95% of the malicious Excel files have macros. Um, so, but again, do we want a model that makes, makes that distinction? I think not, uh, especially not with a 10% false positive rate, which is, uh, again, for such a naive uh, model, so to speak, is not bad, but obviously this is not something that we want to have. Um, 
The same goes if we look at the number of streams. 80% uh, uh, of benign Excel files have less than 10 streams. You know, XLS files, they're OLEs. OLEs are built, built out of streams. So 80% of the uh, benign ones have less than 10 streams, whereas 80% of the malicious ones have anywhere between 11 to 20. Now, again, someone might think, wow, this is an amazing feature, because statistically, it really differentiates between the two, uh, uh, between the two, uh, between the two files, uh, or between the two, uh, you know, categories of files. But again, this is not something that, in and of itself, we want to uh, uh, necessarily affect the decision because then it would create a model that's very, very easily uh, uh, evaded and by or bypassed. Um, similar example, looking at RTF, uh, you know, finding a benign RTF file that has uh, an OLE object embedded in it is, a, is, 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 qu is quite a task uh, because less than 0.5% of uh, benign RTF files, uh, I mean, today I would think, generally speaking, that you know, no RTF is benign because who uses RTF anymore, <laughs> but still. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the benign RTFs that are out there, barely any, any one of them uh, has any kind of OLE object. But if we look at malicious RTF files, so we're talking about 70%, uh, more or less. Uh, again, this is not something that we want to translate immediately into the models that we create. And we need to engineer the data and think about, OK, so how are we actually going to generate a decent data set here? considering the fact that these are the statistics. OK, now we're going to talk about some other distortions uh, uh, and noise um, phenomenons in threat intelligence that are not necessarily related to a specific file format, but more to a specific landscape or just to you know, what we're seeing in threat, landscape, in, in, in threat intel sources. A lot of what we'll see here lies in the fact that you know, uh, the threat sources that we look at, doesn't matter if it's the biggest threat sources, the most, you know, the most expensive one with the biggest number of files and the best coverage of the threat landscape, they don't reflect the reality. They are, they are a function of the reality, okay? Uh, they're probably a much closer and better function uh, of the malicious threat landscape as far as the benign files that exist in the world, they obviously uh, um, contain a fraction of, what's, of what's, what's really out there because, I mean, most benign files don't find their way into these uh, uh, sources and feeds. Um, and, and that, again, that in itself causes some kind of weird phenomenons that we'll, we'll now look at. The first is uh, uh, time distribution. And this is uh, uh, something that we did looking uh, pretty much at all of the uh, uh, PDF files found in VirusTotal uh, from a period of six years, okay, between 2012 and 2017. Now, if you look at the distribution of these, uh, uh, of, 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 of the files per month, you see like quite a weird phenomenon. You see that. If we look at the beginning of, the t of this time period, uh, it seemed like almost everything, well, not almost everything, but uh, I mean, roughly, I don't know, two thirds, maybe even three quarters of the total PDF files you can find, vi you could find virus all were actually malicious. Whereas if you look later into that time period, that tends uh, tendency seems to change. And okay, so now one would say, you know, virus toll became so much more popular. I mean, you can't compare between 2012 and 2017. Uh, but then again, it makes you think, is this something that we want to somehow leak into our data set? Because if, even if we say, okay, let's just take 50% of the uh, uh, benign files of all times, 50% of the malicious files of all times, what we'll get in, uh, uh, in our data set is... Uh, is I mean, much more of the benign files that we would have are from the second half of that time period. And that, again, depending on the kind of model that you use, the kind of features that you use, um, that's something that might leak into your model, uh, which is, uh, I think you'd all agree with me that uh, creation, a timestamp in PDFs is not something that's very relevant for their classification. 
Uh, and, and this is something that's found in just in, in, in clear text and pretty much every PDF out there. Um, th this is the, ca the looking again at the distribution, but just looking at absolute. Uh, I mean, looking at each of the landscape and and and, and seeing how that specific, either the benign or the malicious landscape uh, distribute in time. What we also see, and again, this comes, uh, comes back to those mass duplications we talked about before, as we're also seeing some like very weird and uh, obviously out of the ordinary uh, uh, months uh, where suddenly uh, th there's a huge surge in the amount of, of malicious samples and sometimes even in the benign samples um, that, are th th that you can find. So again, both this uh, uh, this phenomenon, so to speak, but also th this one with these distorted months. Uh, again, this is something that needs to be looked at because, uh, again, it, it might if, if we just look at things randomly, it might really affect the data that we uh, uh, that we put into our uh, to our data sets. So. Uh, <clears throat> Um, these uh, statistics are uh, talking about uh, a, a data set of uh, 64 bits p. Um, so as you can see, uh, with the random data sets of 64 bits p, there is uh, around 90% of the files uh, just .dot uh, assemblies files. Um, so again, it's uh, it's a huge bias to .dot assembly and. Uh, Probably that this is not what you are trying to generalize the model on when you take like 64 bits uh, data set. 45% uh, of the data was just uh, Microsoft uh, infected files. Um, um, so again, there is a strong bias uh, to a lot of Microsoft files in the malicious data set. Uh, probably it's not the case in the benign data set. So uh, you'll find out, uh, you, you, you end up with uh, uh, benign and malicious data sets when you have more uh, files that uh, look like uh, Microsoft files in your malicious uh, data sets. Uh, and it might be a problem. So uh, let's see uh, an example uh, for uh, why uh, there are so many uh, malicious infected uh, Microsoft files in, uh, in the data set. Um, so we, th there is a specific uh, DLL DNS API uh, which uh, has been uh, like tens of thousands of times in, in a random uh, data set that uh, we created. Uh, and uh, and we, tr we try to find out like why there are so many DNS uh, API infected files. So uh, one concrete example is, uh, was discovered by uh, Malwarebytes in, uh, in this link. Uh, and uh, what actually was there is the, like a virus that uh, changed the host files. Like uh, it, it was just patching the, the host file in order to hijack uh, the host file. Uh, the host file is a file that uh, like uh, there is, uh, there can be configured like, uh, uh, like DNS entries. Uh, so every time your machine needs to uh, like do, uh, like uh, it, when it needs to do like a DNS query. Uh, so prior to the DNS query, uh, the machine checks inside the host local file. Uh, so by hijacking uh, the host file, uh, the malware can control uh, the DNS uh, that, uh, that are served uh, to the machine. And of course, that uh, as I said, 45% uh, uh, of uh, Microsoft files or uh, alike Microsoft files in the malicious data set might lead easily to false positive on Microsoft files. Uh, another use case uh, lays in the Android lan uh, landscape. Uh, so APK, uh, of course, uh, I guess that you know, uh, is an Android package, uh, like uh, an archive uh, that contains uh, the resources and the stuff for an application. Um, so there are a lot of uh, malicious uh, files in the threat landscape of uh, Android. Uh, there are ran ransomware for uh, Android, uh, spyware, uh, a lot of differences of uh, PUA, uh, but also there is a specific type of, uh, of malware, uh, premium SMS, like uh, an application that uh, what it does is just like uh, sending SMS uh, messages from uh, from users in order to monetize it. 
uh, and to like pay money from by the user to the to the attacker. Uh, so we created uh, again a random uh, data set uh, and we were looking at uh, the families uh, of the malware uh, that lay uh, that lay inside the data set so as you can see we looked at uh, the the three top uh, families all the three top families uh, are uh, composed uh, are uh, like uh, taking uh, around the uh, 37% of the data set, and all of them were a uh, premium SMS. So again, uh, here's another use case of a strong bias to something that we probably didn't want like the model, like the, the, the APK data set to be uh, biased to. Like we probably wanted it to be um, more uh, like uh, presenting the, the, real, uh, the, the real different types of like malicious APK that, that are out there. All right, so uh, now we'll uh, conclude and uh, we will uh, like uh, show you like, uh, also we'll say, we'll talk about some takeaways from this presentation, but uh, first I'll start with uh, like uh, a process that uh, we are doing post-training and uh, can be taken and uh, applied uh, like it's a uh, process or an attitude that you can take and apply after that uh, post-training uh, for your models. Uh, so uh, first you need to identify like a pattern, a specific pattern. For example, uh, as I said earlier, uh, let's take uh, for example a PE model. So you, if the data set was biased as uh, we've seen earlier, so maybe you might have false positive on Microsoft files. Um, then uh, what you need to do is like going back to your data set. Uh, the reason is to, to look at the training set that the model was generalized, generali gen generalized on, sorry, generated, <laughs> generated from, yeah. Uh, in order to like uh, examine the, the pattern appearance uh, to see uh, how, it, uh, dis how it's distributed inside a benign data set and the malicious data set in the training set. Um, sometimes you can go even further and uh, look at uh, the feature level and uh, like trying to create uh, like what is the f combination of features that uh, makes your, uh, m makes this file or this uh, uh, collection of files uh, look like uh, a malicious file for uh, for the model uh, leads to false positive, of course. Uh, and by that, uh, you need to understand the meaning. So for example, in the collection earlier that I described, you uh, might uh, call it like a Microsoft files or a DNS API DLL file. Uh, the last step is like uh, adjusting and engineering uh, the feature distribution or the pattern distribution inside the training set. Uh, so Tal just talked about, uh, you know, uh, how we might use all the, all, all the data that we've shown here in the false positive or for the false negative research uh, um, phase that, again, usually occurs post-training, whether it's when you still, whether it's when you're still, you know, testing and evaluating your uh, newly created model, or even if it's, you know, in, for the folks here that are coming from, you know, AI based uh, from AI vendors or from next gen vendors or whatever, or the legacy ones that are now using machine learning as well. Uh, uh, you can do it on, of course, on your production data. Okay, so false, th false positives and false negatives that occur in production. But uh, a lot of what we talked about uh, comes back to you know, what we do pre-training and again, how we build and engineer the best data sets possible that will ultimately uh, enable us to create the best models possible. And those are some of the, uh, uh, the you know, the do's, so to speak, uh, or, or the recommendations that we have uh, uh, based on what we've seen. Uh, the first is, you know, we need to really understand the threat landscape and whatever is the problem that you're trying to solve and think about how it might affect the data, 
uh, because it might affect the data. You need to really differentiate between, uh, uh, again, those innate features or uh, uh, features in the general term of features, not in <laughs> model features, uh, uh, but, but the features in the file format or, or the functionality of the file format, how that's abused in the threat landscape. And of course, what's you know, not really a, an abuse of the format, but something that's, you know, uh, again, a vulnerability or an exploit that, that, that could be leveraged, those things will manifest differently in, uh, the, the, in, in your benign data sets and your, in your malicious data sets. And you need, to think about caref you need to think about that carefully and understand that before you go about building your data sets. Uh, another, th uh, another thing that, that, that we, that we want to mention is, that, again, different file formats uh, behave and distribute very, very, very differently from one another. Sometimes uh, it's, uh, you could see that in, um, I even in, uh, in, in formats that are very, very closely related, let's say PEs, 32-bit and 64-bit don't look the same, don't behave the same, uh, at least as far as their, their distribution and the th threat landscape. Uh, is concerned, um, and, and, and again, this goes also to different types of document files, or even if we look at even more specific packages uh, or formats like OLEs, so again, doc files and Excel files and PowerPoint files don't distribute uh, uh, the same, although their format is the same one. Uh, one of the most important takeaways, uh, we believe, is that uh, we all need to very carefully examine the raw data that uh, uh, that we take and uh, examine its, its its distribution, meaning okay, uh, of course I, I believe we all you know normally try to you know build the biggest data sets possible uh, with respect to you know whatever we can find or how big the the, the available data is, and if, and sometimes it's a question of, of the resources and, and, and computation that we have at hand, but. Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, yes, a good approach is starting from as big as possible, but then uh, really examining the distribution and making sure that it seems reasonable. Um, noise and distortion can be found somewhere in the most, uh, can be sometimes found in the most unexpected of places like time distribution uh, with really just, you know, weird, uh, uh, weird phenomenons of like months where you know, PDF was the king of the malware or whatever, but uh, it's not actually the case. And usually it is some kind of distortion that you better if, if, if you clean it out. Now, in a lot of what we've mentioned here, there's no, you know, there are no textbook recipes, okay? Uh, but as we all know, well thought of trial and error is our best friend uh, in many cases in, 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 in applying AI into, into the field we're in. So, and this is the part where you know, data science is a bit of an art as well. Uh, uh, yes, of course, there will be more files with uh, uh, macros in a malicious uh, Excel um, data set. But whether we want to have that exact distribution the way it is if we look at the raw data, uh, our recommendation is no. Uh, uh, engineer that, uh, that somehow differently. In what way, whether you do it with over sampling or with you know, uh, compromising for a smaller data set with a different distribution, again, that lies, th that depends on, on everybody sitting here and your peers and colleagues, but um, we recommend that you again look at the things and uh, you know do your trial and error and see uh, uh, and see what's best. Different models, different you know feature spaces, different file formats, different threat landscape. The solution for them is is quite different. This pretty much concludes uh, our talk. Thank you all very much for listening, and we'll be happy to take any questions if there are. In a way, <laughs> but the question is, what is your bias? And how, uh, and again, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Sometimes that problem might be, if you are at the very, very early stage, how do I build the best model that generalizes 
on the right things and not on distribution of, of, of the threat landscape as it is, because that might lead to adverse results. And sometimes in order to fix something that you already find to be problematic, a specific pattern that consistently is causing false positives or false negatives, and then our recommendation is go back to your data. Sometimes the problem is not in, sometimes the problem is not algorithmic. It's not in your feature space. It's not in your you know, model architecture or the specific algorithm you chose. Sometimes the problem simply lies. It might not be that simple to solve it, but the problem lies in the data itself. Uh, just uh, want to add something. Uh, the issue is that uh, it's it's when you create a data set, it's not possible to find out like all the, these biases. So in many cases, you just you know after seeing some production environment or yeah, like after tackling and using the model for uh, for a period, uh, you you find out these patterns and these biases. So that's the point that it's not always um, so easy to find them out. This, uh, this is a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, but it's, uh, I'll repeat the question. Did we try to uh, come up with some kind of metric to build data sets or to balance them? Uh, the, 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 the short answer is yes. The longer answer is yes, but it's way out of scope for this talk and for 45 minutes because it's just, it's so, um, um, it, it's, just, it's so different between different file types and different formats and different threat landscape. So again, there's no textbook recipe. And it also, I mean, what we've done is, you know, is good for our approach, for our models, for the way that we work, for our infrastructure and framework. It might be very, very different for other researchers, for other companies that use intrinsically different approaches, algorithms, models, data sources, et cetera. So, and, the, and in that sense, what we said, there's no textbook recipe. If there was one, we, we'd share it. Thank you all.